Previously I demonstrated using my oscilloscope to make AC power line measurements and one of the problems with that is the oscilloscope has an 8-bit resolution. I was curious how far I could improve on that measurement so I thought what I'd do is try using a basic principle of oversampling and decimation to improve on the resolution of the scope. I also thought about maybe doing some type of a temperature compensation, maybe reading an external reference. So I thought what I'd do is just walk you through some of the basics of how this is kind of all played out. If we look at the Nyquist frequency, that's going to be two times the signal that we're interested in looking at. So if I've got a 10 hertz signal, for example, I would sample at 20 hertz. If we're going to oversample, that's going to be 4 to the nth, or the number of bits that I want to add to my A to D, times the Nyquist frequency. Obviously, it would be a question on how much data you can store inside the oscilloscope, how long do you want that thing to collect for, how fast is it going to be to pull the data off the scope. So we got to look at those kind of trade-offs to see how far we can push it. If we look at IEC 61000-3-2, they'll measure 40 harmonics out. So for 60 hertz, the harmonic content is going to be between 120 and 2400 hertz. So rather than using Nyquist to two times the signal that we're interested in, we're going to use three times the signal, or 7200 hertz. So again, looking at the oversample frequency of 4 to the nth, for an 8-bit system, for example, 4 to the 0 is 1, so we'd have a sampling frequency of 7200 hertz. For 9 bits, for example, it would be 4 to the 1st, or 4, so we're going to be 4 times 7200, or 28.8. So as we carry this on up to 12 bits, or 4 additional bits, that's 4 to the 4th, or 256x over sampling, or 1.8 megahertz. So we're going to pick the closest thing, which is 2 megahertz. If we capture the data for half a second, depending on if we're looking at 60 or 50 hertz, we're going to have either 30 or 25 cycles collected. If we look at how much data we're having to pull off the scope, for every half second, it's going to be 2 million points or a million for the voltage and a million for the current. So what we're going to do with our oversampled data, we have sample 0 on up to sample 255, and we're going to accumulate or sum all those samples. And then what we're going to do is decimate them. So decimate meaning we're going to do a right shift or a divide. So in this case, if we're 12 bits, we're going to divide it by 16. We can use this technique to gain resolution of our A to D. The problem is, is there will be a nonlinearity associated with it. So what we're going to do for starts is we're going to take a PC, which is already connected to our DSO and collecting the data, and we're going to connect up a very high resolution DAC, very precision, and then we're going to use that to drive the DSO's input. Then what we're going to do is we're going to step the DAC through at linear increments, and we're going to take the measurements, and we'll plot the ADC's nonlinearity. This is some of the very first data I took using the DAC. Again, this is using a 20-bit DAC driving into the scope's front end. And as we can see here, this is not a perfect straight line. So what I did is I did a least squares fit on this, and you can see how far this is off. I'll just, uh, we zoom into an area here. So the red representing a perfect line, and the white representing our data. This is looking at the raw data's deviation from the perfect line using least squares. So the next thing I wanted to do is some type of a repeatability study. So I swept the DAC from 0 to 5 volts multiple times, and I collected that data. And once again, I did a least squares fit on that. Then I plotted the deviation of the raw data from the perfect line. And what you can see here are three different runs. So this is about a half an hour to run this single sweep. And what we can see is on the second sweep, it overlays right on top of this. So then I was thinking, okay, this is definitely repeatable. So if we look at channel 2, that's the pink line, and you can see there's quite a bit of difference. And again, repeating the signal on channel 2, we can again see it overlays. So it's very repeatable, and again, we're looking at about an hour and a half to collect this data. So again, this is looking at our raw data, and again, I've swept the DAC from 0 to roughly 4.5 volts. We'll enable our least squares fit. We'll zoom into this a little bit, and here we can see the steps of the A to D. Again, due to the nonlinearity of the A to D of the oscilloscope, we can see that our raw data does not match the least squares fit. And again, we see the same pattern that we saw before. Again, this is the difference between the raw data and the least squares fit data. And what we'd like to do is take this and use this to make a model. The first thing we're going to do with this data is we're going to filter it. 
we're going to set up a zero phase filter using a Butterworth and an IIR. So if we look at the difference of the data here, the blue is our raw data and our pink represents the filtered data. So if we take our original signal and what we're going to do is feed that through our model to back out this nonlinearity. So what we'll do is we're going to use that model, we'll feed our data back through and then we'll run another least squared fit on that and again we'll look at the I and L data. So the green line again is the before and this is the after. We've gone from about plus or minus nine counts to about plus or minus three counts. So this has greatly improved on our nonlinearity. It starts out pretty good, it's plus or minus one count, and then about a volt out, something happens. And if we look at our raw data, and we kind of zoom in here and we'll look at our steps, and something happens here with this as we get closer to that one volt signal right there. Again, we push the system in pretty far. My guess is this has something to do with the architecture of the A to D itself. So if we look at the before and after data again, so I've got all three plots shown now. Our raw data will be in white. The least squares fit will be in green. And the red will be the compensated. And we can see now the compensated data in red closely matches our least squares fit line. Certainly a lot closer than our original data. If you remember looking at the AC line coming into our house, it's definitely not nice and sinusoidal like what you'd expect. Making any sort of a harmonic distortion measurement is a little difficult. So what I've done is I've taken an RF generator and I'm using that to drive a high voltage amplifier. This amplifier will easily put out 100 plus volts. We'll use this to drive our little box that has the transformer in it and then that'll go back into our DSO and down to the PC. First thing we want to do is look at the drift of this system over the course of a few hours. This is in seconds, so this is roughly 7300 seconds or roughly two hours of data. And we can kind of get an idea of how much this thing drifts. I've been trying to correlate the data from the Bryman against what the DSO is providing me. And the two seem to match fairly close, so I suspect the majority of the drift is from the amplifier's offset. So if we look at the digital output of this, and then the upper right here, this is the voltage RMS. So it's reading 110.9392. And we can see the Bryman is reading 110.99. So well under 1% of error. So if we adjust our amplifier a little bit, we'll take it down. This is roughly 107 volts. Again, we can see the Bryman against the PC match fairly closely. Just a small amount, as fine as, I'm going to take the ARB and I'm going to step this up um, as fine as a scale as I can in the voltage range. So this is one step of the ARB. This is the next step. And this is the next step. And this is another step. And another step. Each vertical division is 50 millivolts. Okay, in the upper right here we can see the frequency on the Bryman is reading roughly 100 hertz. And we compare that with the frequency coming off of the scope, which is roughly 100 hertz as well. That's not actually calculated by the oscilloscope. After we do the oversampling and the decimation, we're actually running FFT on that data and we're calculating the frequency from that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the frequency. This is one hertz. It's 
be one tenth of a hurt. You can see it's no problem to detect that frequency whatsoever. It's actually a bit more accurate than what the Bryman can do. As long as we're looking at this page, you can see the software has changed somewhat. Clicking across the top, this is the voltage in RMS, the peak voltage, the crest factor for the voltage. But here we have the uh, RMS current, the peak current, the crest factor for the current. Next we have the real power in watts, the apparent power in VA, and the reactive power in VAR. Down here, of course, the frequency, and to the right of that is the power factor. Looking at the first 40 harmonics for the voltage waveform, we can calculate the total harmonic distortion is 1.7. So before I pull this apart, I thought I'd show you a couple of things. The amplifier that I'm using, again, it's homemade, does not have enough output power to drive an incandescent light bulb at 70 watts. So this is looking at the AC waveform. And it's also very clean for looking at things like distortion, this would definitely be the way to go versus using our AC line. The other thing we can do with this is we can change the waveform shape. Here we can see a triangle. And we can see what this does to our distortion. You can see we've gone from roughly 1.7 to 11.9. Here we can see our even and odd harmonics. Just looking at a square wave. Again, this is looking at the raw signal coming into our house. And again, we can see that it's not very sinusoidal. Now currently I have this thing hooked to a 70 watt incandescent light bulb and currently the light bulb is turned off so we can see here this is the current in red and the white is obviously our voltage. I'll go ahead and I'll turn the light bulb on and what I've done is I've made this so I can normalize the data so if I want to see the two overlaid we can see the normalized voltage is in green and the normalized current is in blue and we can see the two are very much in phase we would expect that obviously for an incandescent bulb this is looking at the line voltage again so we can see it's 116 volts coming in or 160 volts peak crest factor is 1.38 RMS current about uh, 0.6 amps peak current about 0.8 crest factor for the current is 1.4 watts roughly uh, 68 watts and our reactive power again quite low power factor is roughly one we'd expect that for our resistive bulb looking at the phase plot again we can see that we're roughly at zero degrees and here we're looking at the voltage harmonics this selects the current harmonics. The THD for the current is roughly 2.9 percent. We can also view this in digital. This is the amplitude of each harmonic in volts. And again we have our data logging. If I just clear this out, we have the voltage RMS, current RMS, frequency, we have the two crest factors for voltage and current, the power factor, real power, apparent power, and reactive power. And all this can be logged to the disk, so if I just hit record, this will record everything into a CSV file. Let's be looking at a LED type bulb. This thing is marked at uh, 60 hertz, 120 volts. It draws roughly 75 milliamps. So our voltage is a little low, 
um, it's not quite 120 volts and we're seeing roughly uh, 70 milliamps of current draw or roughly uh, seven and a half watts eight watts of uh, parent power and we can see the bulb itself is pretty much in phase THD for this light bulb is roughly 10 percent we compare that with our incandescent bulb at roughly 3 percent also got this fluorescent bulb here uh, this is a Sylvania it says uh, 23 watts 120 volts, about uh, 380 milliamps. So again, the green trace is our voltage, and our blue trace here is our current. Again, this data is normalized. And we can see it's drawing roughly uh, 300 milliamps of current. And again, the voltage is a little low. So about 24 watts uh, true power or 36 watts apparent power. See the power factor now is 0 0.6. <laughs> Obviously not even close to what an incandescent bulb is going to be. So I wouldn't say that the oscilloscope is a good tool to actually make power measurements. Again, I just made this video for fun. But I thought it would be a good demonstration to show what you could do with an oscilloscope by oversampling and decimating the data. So hopefully it was helpful for a few of you. Feel free to post any comments that you have or questions. Later.